six, I was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. And uh, at that stage, the doctor suggested that I either learn music or practice some type of martial art or physical activity. I remember karate lessons very kind of faintly in my memory now. And I also remember that someone got a bloody nose. And that wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do. I had a lot of energy, but I just didn't like the idea of hurting myself. And so I continued on to, to violin, actually. I still have the, the picture of my first violin recital. I'd be on the BART, and uh, people would often just ask me, do you play jazz? And I didn't quite know um, if they would ask all the violinists that question, or if they would just ask me, this young black kid sitting on BART with this instrument. One of my newest influences uh, has been a Guadalupian composer whose name is Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges. He was a, a violinist, and at times he's called the Black Mozart. He was the harpsichord teacher of the French queen, Marie Antoinette. I play violin as well as viola, and my uh, music degree uh, from Oberlin Conservatory was in viola. And so for the longest time, I played violin, and I switched to viola in 14, and the viola essentially was just given to me. No one even told me that day that I was going to play viola. And I realized that it, it has a different part, it has a different voice, and uh, I eventually started to uh, become more enamored with the viola. In that sense, um, one of my favorite uh, performance experiences has been indeed playing uh, string quartets. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to do a tour with a string quartet to Panama. Um, the collaboration is always this really fascinating exchange where not everyone knows everything, but not everyone has the same job. But it doesn't mean that someone else can't help me do my job better. Sing a song full of the faith. Those are um, the really powerful experiences for the musicians as well as uh, for artists. But to be able to create those spaces are, are very different than just participating in them. It was much easier to go play in the youth orchestra than try to make a new youth orchestra. <laughs> I've also done a lot of traveling as a, uh, doing research, completing my PhD. And so more often than not, I've been a researcher with my violin with me. The past 10 years, more so, my life has been in France, outside the United States, and more particularly in Guadeloupe. There, I had the opportunity to teach English for a year on a Fulbright Fellowship, which was uh, this super immersive experience which eventually began uh, my studies of French Creole. I was welcomed in full open arms by the entire community there, both research community as well as uh, people not interested in research, but those who were curious about what I was doing. It allowed me to learn a great deal about uh, the place, about the people there, and I basically see myself writing and I see myself performing. The past years, I've had the opportunity to better develop the music performance aspect of my research. And I'm deeply interested in sharing the type of literary history that I've studied, which is based upon people uh, sharing languages around the globe. It's based upon the preservation of cultures around the world. My interest really is in the history that I was able to unearth upon arrival to Costa Rica. I'd never taken Spanish, but somehow I knew what people were saying to me. I understood the numbers. And no one told me that after studying French that in Spanish the numbers sound the same. And so at that stage I realized that, okay, maybe I should start uh, studying more Spanish. Uh, but then I had the opportunity to travel to Italy. And there I studied Italian before arriving because I didn't want it to be like before, and so I prepared myself, and I found that uh, I understood what was happening, and I spoke accurately. And so it was kind of at that moment that I committed to teaching myself foreign languages and also finding a way to teach other people how to communicate. 